All right. Looks like it's working this time. <laughs> it was. It stopped like after about eight minutes. Yes, last time. So you could have gotten the first eight minutes of the lecture last Monday, which was basically me up there. I think I did a little dance. That was all you'd have gotten. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Anyway, so <laughs> let's do a little bit of review of review what we covered last time. So we got into chapter 15, which was fiscal policy. So. The definition of discretionary fiscal policy is basically the government putting its hand in the economy, right? That's its job. Right? The, the bookie definition is to write government intervention in the economy to change spending or taxing and or taxing to affect aggregate demand. The key here is that, that we're trying to affect the demand side of the economy, right? So this is really demand side fiscal policy because we're going to talk about supply side a little bit. But that's the goal be behind this first part of it. And there's two parts, right? Notice that I didn't say that we were always trying to grow aggregate demand. We're just trying to affect it one way or the other, right? Because if we're practicing expansionary fiscal policy, we're trying to grow aggregate demand. And the idea there is to fight recessions, right? Growth in aggregate demand is what will get us out of a recession. That's the idea. And you now just explained that by the answering the first question in the quiz, right? When we're in a recession, when we somehow get growth in aggregate demand, we'll see GDP start to rise. We'll see employment start to go up. Same sort of business, right? Except on that first question, it was the consumers doing it. Normally, that doesn't work. It's the government that does it. On the other side of it, you can also be trying to rein in aggregate demand. And we do this when we are near full employment. And what we're doing here is trying to fight inflation, right? So if the economy is humming along, GDP is growing at 4, 5, 8, or 9%, like China and India right now, right? They both have GDPs growing at somewhere between 8 and 10% over the last five to six years. But what do they also have with their amazing full employment and growth going on in GDP? Tons of inflation. Inflation in India and China is in the double digits, 10 to 12%. Right? And what their governments have been trying to do is this. All right. Now, the way the government tries to decide how much it wants to affect aggregate demand is by using this marginal propensity to consume and the spending multiplier. Please remember that the marginal propensity to consume is the percentage of each dollar that you get that you will spend on real GDP. So if someone gives you a dollar, how much of it are you going to spend on GDP and how much of it are you going to save or buy used things or you know accidentally burn? <laughs> Regardless, right? It's how much of it are you going to spend on GDP? And the idea then is that this equation is what gives you the spending multiplier. Please remember that the spending multiplier, it's a number that you use to multiply by spending. Hence the term spending multiplier, right? So the idea is that when you look at the circular flow model and money flows around the circular flow model, right? So if we give businesses $100 million, or in this case, if we cut spending by the government by $200 million, so the government quits spending $200 million, right? So up in the product market, there's $200 million less. When there's $200 million less in the product market, what happens to businesses? They hurt, right? They lose $200 million. So when they lose $200 million, what do they do? They say, oh, all of you employees, 75% of you kicked out the door, right? And when 75% of consumers lose their jobs, what happens to the consumers spending money up in the product market? It goes down. And that cycles on and on and on again, right? And that's what leads to this multiplier effect, right? So this is how most problems will be started, right? I will give you what the MPC is. I will always give it to you. You'll have some percent. And following right after it, I will always tell you what the spending multiplier is, OK? So you don't have to actually do this formula ever. 
right? So no fractions in this class. So you know that the spending multiplier is four. So if the government cuts spending by $200 million, what do you expect to happen to aggregate demand or GDP? Right. So GDP will fall. And how much will it fall by? And how did you get 800 million? You took the spending multiplier and multiplied it by the spending. Woohoo! Right? I mean, really deep, complicated math. We expect GDP or aggregate demand to drop by approximately $800 million. So that was the spending side of it. What else could the government do? They could change taxes, right? So there is a slightly different taxing multiplier. And again, it's the number that you multiply a change in taxes by to get the ultimate change in aggregate demand or GDP. And you calculate this by using the very, very complicated mathematical formula of taking the spending multiplier and subtracting 1. All right, and the reason that you subtract 1 is that when the government cuts taxes or increases taxes, the first hit of that money does not hit GDP. Right? When the government spends money, it always spends it on GDP. When the government gives you guys a tax break, you don't do that. Shame on you guys. Right? Well, not necessarily. But the idea is then that you have one less additional you know, hit into the economy or gain into the economy because of a taxing change. So in this case, Let's assume that the same problem above, right? MPC is 75%. Spending multiplier is 4. Suppose that this time you hear that government, uh, well, yeah, let's do the same thing. Cuts taxes by $50 million. And I ask you, what's going to be the ultimate change in aggregate demand or GDP? So GDP rises. Why are you saying rises? Because you're cutting taxes. Remember that cutting taxes gives you more money. So you will spend more. That's the idea. So the GDP will rise. And how much will it rise by? by $150 million, because this is the spending multiplier. How do we get the taxing multiplier? Subtract 1. So it's 3. 3 times 50 gives you the $150 million. All right? And again, what this MPC number is, how the government calculates it, it's a nasty I don't, they don't do a very good job of it. <laughs> Let's leave it at that. Okay? But the fact remains is that if we did know what this was, if we did know how to calculate it correctly, all of this application would work relatively nicely. And over history, if you look at pre-2005 you know, time, they've been pretty good about knowing what MPC is. They, again, how they figured it out, I don't know. But they did a fairly decent job, and that's why recessions prior to 2009 have been relatively short-lived. Because as soon as the government sees that GDP falls for two quarters, they step in and say, how much is GDP falling? It's falling by you know, $200 billion. So they're like, great, we need to stimulate at least $200 billion worth of, of GDP. So they get out their MPC calculator, they figure out what the spending multiplier is, and they jack up spending by whatever that number is that makes it turn GDP around. Because once you can turn GDP around, once people start feeling like they have money again, what are they going to do? They spend it. And once people start spending on top of the government spending, that's when recovery occurs. Okay? Part of the reason why the, re the recovery didn't occur in 2009 is that the government either couldn't calculate what MPC was correctly, or 
They couldn't figure out how much money, they couldn't get enough money to spend. One of the two. Or they couldn't agree on how much they were going to spend. Which is, yeah, I mean, essentially the same thing. <laughs> so they, you know, a lot of economists, and not all of them, mind you, but a lot of them believe that the reason why our recovery is so slow is that the government just didn't pump enough into the economy back in the initial stages of the recession. All right, so that's the review of what we've already done. Any questions on what we've done so far? No. Cool. So. Da, 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 da. All right, now, we, did we talk about automatic stabilizers? We didn't get to them? Okay. So this discretionary part stuff that we we're talking about is, is fiscal policy that is a change, right? So the government is good, going to do something different than it's already doing. They have to pass some law that says, here comes a stimulus package, or here comes a tax cut slash tax increase, what have you, all right? Built into our set of laws are already set up a bunch of automatic stabilizers, things that are trying to keep the economy out of nasty recessions or niches of inflation, right? So when the economy is humming, it tries to rein aggregate demand back. And when, when, you know, when the economy sucks, it tries to push the economy, all right? So laws that are in place already that add to government spending or take away from aggregate demand already or period, right? And the idea here is according to the state of the economy, i.e., when the economy is humming, it pulls it back, and when it's sucking, it pushes it forward. All right, so can you think of something that the government does automatically when we go into a recession that tries to keep the recession from becoming too bad? i.e., what would the government potentially do to make sure that people have enough money to spend on the appropriate necessities of living? Well, th these are stimulus, right? This is not money pumping in. It's money that you're going to get already, right? So imagine you get laid off. What do you do? File ah, you file for unemployment, right? When the economy sucks, people get laid off. When people get laid off, they have no money to spend, hence consumer spending lags. So how do you keep consumer spending up even though they're not getting paid or they're not working? Government starts pumping out unemployment dollars. And what happens when the economy turns around and we're closer to full employment? What happens to unemployment payments? They go away, right? I mean, it's kind of nice, right? What other things are like that automatically? Medical benefits, you could think of, a, think of it as Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, food stamps. Welfare, what have you, all of those sorts of things that they, now these are all the things that push the economy automatically. So you've got that part of it down, but it also works what slows you down? So all, imagine, if you will, all of a sudden you, all of you in this room, got a job next week making $100,000 a year. Taxes. That's absolutely right. Income taxes. What's the one thing that's going to hold you back from spending all of that $100,000? The fact that you know you're going to all of a sudden jump into a much higher tax bracket. 
and that those higher tax rates at 100, the things that are going to stop you from taking every penny that you're making and pumping it into the economy, right? Because imagine if, if everybody in this school all of a sudden got a $100,000 job, right? I mean, what happens to the economy in Janesville? Yeah, I mean, it's going to start humming, right? All of a sudden, there's going to be companies moving into this, th this city. They're going to start hiring tons more people, blah, blah, blah. All the economy starts turning around. Bam. Now, all of a sudden, we've got this you know, no unemployment and huge inflation, right? Because you guys are constantly buying up all the goods. And there's not enough stores out there yet, right? So the store, you know, there's not enough McDonald's. There's not enough Starbucks. There's not enough gas stations, what have you. Until those are built, what are you guys going to keep doing? You're going to keep fighting each other to buy the, the goods off the shelf. They're like, no, no, those are my ding-dongs. And, you know, <laughs> Twinkies. That's right. Those are actually being made, supposedly, sometime $1. soon. $1. Right, yeah. Supposedly that Hostess sold it off to somebody. Uh, <laughs> See? <laughs> Yeah, I know. I know exactly <laughs> how you feel. Or like G.I. Joe or Army Men or whatever. You wanted to feel like <laughs> you got the face when you were seven on it. That's how cringy it is in real life. All right. So anyways, now the question then is, since these automatic stabilizers in, are in place, what does this mean the government has to do? All right. What it leads to, uh, well, let's... Exactly. So how or when are we borrowing money? Well, let's look at a little mini graph, because graphs are great at showing this kind of stuff. Um, money, GDP. So let's think about this in terms of both of these types of examples, right? So when GDP is low, when GDP is over here closer to the you know, life sucks range, How much money is the government shelling out for unemployment? Too much. Lots, right? OK, so this is, we'll do this in red, because this is government money going out. That's, that's red ink for the government, right? So when GDP is low, these are their payouts, right? When GDP turns around and gets closer to full employment, so GDP gets higher, how much money is the government paying out in unemployment and Medicare and Medicaid and all this stuff? Less, right? So as GDP gets higher, our payouts become less. And what do you do when you have two dots on a, on a, on a picture? Connect. You connect them. Yay, kindergarten. <laughs> so this line represents the amount of money the government has to pay when it comes to dealing with these automatic stabilizers. Now, we'll switch to black for the government collecting money, right? Because that's, that's the stuff that's good for the government. Again, imagine, if you will, that you guys all became president. These are the sorts of things you'd worry about, right? What color are lines on? <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> when, how much taxes is the government collecting? Not very much, right? Because what happens when GDP is really high? They're collecting lots of money in taxes. And so now we connect the dots again. These are our collections. And so at some point in time, where GDP is a certain level, the amount that they pay out in unemployment and the amount that, right? That's where we have a nice, balanced budget. Has that happened in our never. country's system? Never. <laughs> in 1990, never. <laughs> there wasn't a whole lot. But the idea is that when we're in a recession, right? So here's GDP in a recession. What's going on in the government coffer world, right? Here's GDP during a recession. Here's how much they have to pay out. Here's how much they have to collect. What's the difference between those two? That's debt. The government must be allowed to go into debt. If you forced the government to balance its budget, it wouldn't be able to handle situations where the recession was bad enough such that the payouts are greater than the collections. I mean, the idea then is that at some stage, once enough people are unemployed, the government's going to have to say, OK, anybody else after this? Tough luck. Right? Well, I mean, they, they paid for, 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 for quite a while, right? And they still are. And so what's the government doing? It's going into debt. Now, in theory, remember, we, 
economy works in cycles, right? So eventually, the economy is going to turn around, right? It's going to, quote unquote, recover and maybe even get all the way out to full employment. Who knows? But the idea then is that now, how much are we collecting versus how much we're paying? This would be a government surplus. And the idea is that as the, as the economy cycles around, right, we'll be in debt for a little while. And once we recover and start getting back to that GDPs above the stage where we're collecting money, what would we do with our surplus? Pay off the debt, right? In, an, in, in a this is the way the government really should work way, this is why we don't mind the debt because we know at some stage we're going to turn around and get a surplus, and that's when we're going to pay it off. Now, that unfortunately hasn't really happened in the history of the US over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, cer <laughs> certainly not in the 2000s, right? I mean, the economy was humming in 2001 to 2007. Why didn't we pay off the debt in that time? Because we were at war. That's absolutely right. War costs money, folks. So all of that surplus money, I mean, the government, from an automatic stabilizer pers perspective, was they were in the black. Right? Government was in the black. But when you go to war, <laughs> that black goes away real fast. Right? How much does it cost to buy one of the, uh, one of the tank busters? Well, those are only two or three million. It's the, it's the, the destroyers that cost 17 to 20 million. Right? Right? Those are being built up in northern Wisconsin. Right? That's a, that's a nice low estimate, right? And, but, but you may, again, why, so why didn't it happen in the 90s, right? I mean, because the 90s were another re, re, region where we were humming along. We were, we were still in a war. Oh, yeah, that's right. Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Hmm. So, and this is one of those things that's not necessarily a liberal, conservative, you know, Democrat, Republican issue. Right? It's just a matter of that when we went to war, we had surpluses, unfortunately, and so... We spent our surplus on war materials instead of on debt. And so when we get to this stage in the economy where we've got lots of debt, we kind of go, oh, crap, where'd that come from? <laughs> it's not necessarily that it came from anywhere. It was just that when we recovered, we didn't pay off the debts we'd incurred when we were in a recession. Right? So. <laughs> as consumers are to blame because we just didn't spend our money. <laughs> That's true. Obviously. It, it, it's hard to know who's going to blame because, I mean, y we had to go to those wars, right? I mean, we couldn't say no. Depends on who you are. True. But, you know, theoretically, <laughs> everybody wanted those wars. We were, we were voting for politicians that were agreeing to this war. So really the people who are to blame are the voters because they didn't vote for someone who, who said, pay off the debt instead of go to war, right? So really, blame yourselves. <laughs> but the nice thing about, the, about the, the US voting system is that we can always point the finger at somebody else. Of course. That's, so you never have to accept any blame. Unless you don't vote at all, which is. <laughs> Again, uh, well, let's. <laughs> I don't want to go down that road because who knows what's going to happen. All right, so the last part of of chapter 15 is talking about supply side economics, right? So all of this talk in chapter 15 up until this stage has been the way you adjust the economy is by using aggregate demand. Now, the reason why we consider aggregate demand easier to deal with is that what's one of the non-price determinants of aggregate demand? G, government. So it's real easy for the government to say, well, when we're in a recession, spend more. And when we're having bad inflation, spend less, right? Or continue to spend more, whatever. <laughs> so that part of it is relatively easy. But if you think about it, you could try and affect the supply side as well. 
So here's our aggregate supply curve. Let's assume that our aggregate demand is somewhere in the intermediate range. We're recovering from a, a recession to some degree. And right now, in order to get growth in the economy, we're pushing aggregate demand to the right. And when aggregate demand to, goes to the right, GDP rises, but ri what rises with it? CPI. We get inflation with it, and that kind of sucks, right? So what we would rather have happen would be to see aggregate supply shift to the right. Because what happens when aggregate supply shifts to the right? I mean, yes, GDP is going to grow, but what's the added bonus? CPI goes, down. CPI goes down. We actually get that double bonus of growing GDP and lowering prices. Right? So Reaganomics, which is actually the very beginning of the supply side economists' movement, started in the 80s, where the government said, OK, you know, we are in a, we're in a bit of a recession, but we're starting to come out of it. And the problem we had back then was that inflation skyrocketed way faster than GDP. It, it, it's a debate over why that was necessarily, but the fact remained that we had some growth in GDP, but we had more of was a growth in prices. And so the government was like, well, crap, we want to keep growing because we haven't really hit a full recovery yet, but we, we don't want to push prices anymore. So the government had to come up with a way to say, ah, wait a second, how can we shift aggregate supply? Now, what are the non-price determinants of aggregate supply? Resource costs, technology, taxes and subsidies, and regulations. So the government has some say-so in this stuff, right? So what the government started to do, or what Ronald Reagan came off uh, initially in the early 80s trying to do, was to say, wait a second. Part of the reason why businesses aren't producing more and keeping up with the demand that our, that our consumers have is because we're regulating them too much. So what did we do in the early, early 80s? We went out and said, OK, let's start deregulating certain factors of the economy. Right? So we deregulated the, uh, the power industry first. Right? So he deregulated the, the ownership of electrical companies. Right? It used to be that these were they all had to be in a, their own little group, their own conglomerate of monopolies. Because, of course, remember that electrical companies are all monopolies. And he said, OK, let's deregulate them and let them be run by private industry instead of by government-run companies. And it worked, except um, there were a few minor problems that, that arose in the early 80s, where if you lived in Pennsylvania, you could take a, a match and throw it in the river. And what would the river do? <laughs> it would actually burn. And, and why do you think that was? <laughs> there was just a little bit of pollution in the river. And the company who was running the electrical plant that was doing the polluting said, well, we're, we're polluting according to government standards, right? Because the government had reduced the amount of regulating pollution that was allowed in the rivers. And oops. So the government had to step back in and the problem with it was that the government couldn't take the, the ownership of the companies back. So what they did instead was just re-regulate the companies that are doing it. Right? So that didn't work. Now, what else does the government have control over? Taxes. Corporate tax rates in the 80s dropped from 21% down to 17 18%. Right? Cut corporate tax rates. Give corporations the ability to produce more, hire more individuals. And initially, what businesses did is they said, oh, wow, great, we have this extra money. And they did. They hired more people. And in hiring more people, they actually could produce enough to keep up with demand. And so what happened is that supply grew faster than demand. And what happened to prices? They went down. It's brilliant. Of course, what was also going along at the same time in the 80s? What started getting used in businesses in the 80s? Uh, 
Computers all of a sudden shot through the roof in businesses. And actually what Ronald Reagan did was made this happen. The reason why is that he gave businesses a 50% tax break on every dollar they spent on research and development. So every dollar that a company spent buying a computer, they could write off 50 cents of that dollar on their corporate taxes. Because you know how much a computer cost in the 80s? Yeah, thousands of bucks, right? So, and they were going to use these computers to, to make business more efficient anyways, right? So they were going to buy them regardless of whether the government gave them a subsidy for it. But in his infinite wisdom and his economist said, look, you want this to be pervasive. You want every company doing it. Because then every company is going to be more efficient. They're going to be more effective. And aggregate supply is going to grow even more. And yes, we're going to see growth. And we're going to continue to see prices drop. And so literally in the 80s, from 81 to or 83, when the, the law came into place until 89, businesses, I mean, it used to be that 5% of companies used a computer. In 1989, 75%, 80%, right? Awesome. Brilliant move. So a lot of people think that it was his vision of dealing with taxes and regulations that really pushed towards the supply side economics saving the country or really at least pushing it towards growth without inflation. But it was really the advent of technology that really brought it about. Okay. Now, again, Ronald Reagan was a very you know, enigmatic guy. And he convinced a lot of companies that it was worth it for them to invest in these computers. I mean, again, think about who, the, who resists computers the most. The elderly, right? And who were most of the CEOs? The elderly, right? So it, it took an actor, <laughs> or, I mean a president, to step in <laughs> and convince these old men that, I mean, let's face it, folks, who, who, who are most CEOs? There, there's, what, four CEO women in the, in the Fortune, five, Fortune 100? It's kind of sad if you think about it. But again, right, so he convinced them, you need to do this. And again, it was one of those where, Reagan, he was, he was really good for, for being, a, for being a, uh, uh, an actor instead of a politician. He didn't tell them that they needed it for, him, for themselves, right? CEOs, they were like, you don't need those computers, right? You're not actually going to use one. You don't even have to put one in your office. But what you need it for is the young people, for your grandkids, because that's who you're hiring, right? You're hiring your grandkids. And what do your grandkids do right now? Well, they were sitting at home with the little Coleco and the handheld you know, gaming. And he's like, well, look, they're already set up to use these computers. Right? You need them in there so that when they go to work, they can just like translate those computer skills into real skills. And, and the guys are like, wow, you mean our, our kids will actually work? And they're like, yeah. And they're like, wow, great, buy these things so that they'll quit sitting there playing computer games. Instead, they'll do work. Because it's the same thing, right? Because you're just pushing a bunch of buttons, and little lights are showing up on the screen, and you can shoot the aliens and, and shoot the dollars in the, in the Worked like a charm, though, because they all went for it. Okay. Again, I don't honestly. I'm not sure that's what he was necessarily doing, but he did something to convince them. Besides the fact that they got a 50% tax break on every dollar they spent to lead them into the essentially the the, the, ninth, the 20th century, right? So that's what pushed it in the 1980s. What did it in the 1990s? What did we start using in the 90s? Cell phones and the internet, right? Cell phones and the proliferation of the internet, right? This, so this is the 80s, was getting the computers in there. 90s was getting the cell phones and the internet into the economy. And again, that's what kept our inflation low and our growth moving, right? And unfortunately, in the 2000s, that didn't, you know, it was, a, again, a carryover, right? It was basically more of that being utilized in more businesses throughout the world. Yeah, smartphones and iPads, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The, the simplification of the computer in the, in the 2000s is what continued this process. So really, I mean, this is, and this is what has made us stay a superpower in the, in the world, right? We don't, we don't do any manufacturing very much anymore, right? So what do we do? Well, figuring out how to use these things to make business work, that's what we do. That's what we're good at, right? And the scary thing is, is that, that Japan and India and China, they do it way more than us, right? 
I mean, when they buy something in, in China, they don't use cash. They just flash a phone and say, here, just take it out of my account on my phone. I mean, that's how they do it in Africa, everywhere, because there aren't banks in Africa, right? So the way they get money is they, whenever they get paid, they will just put it on my cell phone account. So the cell phone companies literally have all of this extra cash laying around that pays for the services. And whenever they need to buy something, they just flash their phone at them, and they'll take it off of their cell phone account. Yeah, but the cell phone companies in Africa are really good. They're nice. They would never take advantage of... <laughs> Regardless, right? This is where we were going. All right, now, so those are two of the things that they want to do. Now, one of the other things that supply-side economists argue, and this is, is a, a very classic Paul Ryan argument, is that they say um, lowering income taxes will also stimulate aggregate supply. So if you would just tax people less, right? So, so Reagan was saying, well, it's, it's the taxes on businesses that are the problem. And what the new graduated supply side economists are saying is that, wait, 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 wait. The businesses, you know, when we gave them a tax break, yeah, they used some of that money to, to hire new employees. But once they hired enough employees, did they take the tax breaks away? No. No. So what did the businesses do with the extra money once they'd hired enough employees? Dump it in their pockets. They gave out CEO bonuses, higher management wages. Actually, this is what led to, in the 90s, in the late 80s to the 90s, the separation of wage of income between the people who do the work and the people who manage the people who do the work. Right? So income disparity is what this caused. Because businesses had so much money, they just didn't know what to do with it. And we were still taxing them at 17%. So I mean, that's ungodly. So instead of paying tax on the $100 million worth of profit, they'd say, well, we've got 100 different managers out there who have effectively kept this business humming, what should we do? Ah, just give them all a million bucks. Mm -hmm. And then we don't have to pay any taxes. And all of those managers are happy, right? They'll stay in their job, whipping the people to work harder and be more productive. Yeah. It worked. I mean, we have been more productive. As, as, as workers, we have been more productive through the 90s and the 2000s than any other century. Right. Again, a lot of it's because of the technology and the ability for you guys to absorb it. Right. Good job. Uh, good or bad, I don't know. All right, now, so this is, this is Paul Ryan's argument to, the, to, to Congress, actually. And his, in, his belief is that if we lower income taxes, aggregate supply will grow. The reason why is that The reason we have unemployment is that taxes, individual taxes, right? So personal income taxes are a disincentive to work, right? The fact that the government is going to tax you at, say, you know, 16, 17% on all the money that you earn is a disincentive to work, right? There's no point working if I'm going to get paid $17 an hour or $10 an hour and have to pay 17% of that in taxes. So if we would just lower the tax rate to say like 5 or 6%, what would all of those workers do? They would work harder, right? They would actually start working harder to earn more money because now the more money will stay in their pockets instead of being sent to Uncle Sam in taxes. Right? So lowering taxes will encourage workers to be more productive. That's the new supply side argument. And I've heard it a, you know, more than a few times. This is also a Rand Paul argument as well, is that it's lowering taxes to give workers an incentive to actually work. 
right? Makes sense, right? I mean, if you can stretch it a little. I mean, it's, it's not a, it's not a, a, a bad argument, right? I mean, it's not bad. It's just. Here's a question: If you're going to lower taxes on the workers and you're not going to raise taxes on corporations, where does the money go to the government so we can pay off our debt? Oh, oh, no. The idea, right, is that workers will be more productive, which means they will work more. So even though you lower the tax rate. The more, the more amount of work they do will lead to them earning more money. And even though we're taxing them at a lower rate, it'll even itself out, right? And in fact, it'll lead us to even potentially collecting more in taxes than we would otherwise, because more people will be working, and they'll be working harder. Mm -hmm. It just makes the gap between those highest paid and those lowest paid larger. But that's unimportant, right? That's that's what capitalism is all about, right? You want to be one of those people who's going to become a billionaire, right? You want to have the pot potential of getting there, right? And and if you if if we don't keep that income disparity out there, you may not become one of those people who's a billionaire. Right? I mean, what happens, Naomi, if you all of a sudden come up with the next new great idea and you start the business that's going to make you a billion dollars? Well, <laughs> wait till you have the there money. It is true. I completely agree that there are some that do. And the problem, of course, is that those companies who do pay all of their taxes tend to get um, competed out of the market by those who don't, right? Because if you can somehow not pay your taxes, that means that your costs are less. That means that, right, you have more profit. You can buy more lobbyists. I mean, you can you can invest more into future business. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. So this is one argument that has not really been solidified by economists, right? There's a lot of new economists coming up who believe that this is true, right? Me personally, I mean, what have we said? What did we say at the very beginning of this class, right? That affects aggregate demand. What are the two things that affect aggregate demand? That Discretionary fiscal policy. What can you change? Spending and taxes. Well, if you lower taxes, originally I was saying it shifts aggregate demand. Now what am I saying lowering taxes does? It moves the supply. Well, which, 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 which one is it? Is it? Is it demand or is it supply? It, in theory, it could be both, right? So if it shifts aggregate demand a little bit and aggregate supply shifts a little bit with it, if they both shift to the right, what might happen? Right, so here's aggregate supply. Here's aggregate demand. So if aggregate demand shifts to the right and aggregate supply shifts to the right, there's no change in CPI, but what do we get? A huge change in GDP. And this is exactly what the supply side economists are saying. Is they're, they're saying, OK, yeah, maybe there will be a little bit of growth in aggregate demand, but the growth in aggregate supply will make up for that so that prices won't go up. We won't see any inflation. And we'll get this huge bonus in GDP, right, if we just give people the incentive to work. Isn't that awesome? And graphically, it even makes sense. So. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> I mean, that's ne not necessarily incorrect, but, that, but that's the idea behind it, right? And the jobs would be created because once we lower income taxes on people, they will work more. And when they work more, they will have more money. Once they have more money, what do they do? They spend it. Once they start spending it, what are the businesses they're going to start to do? They're going to start hiring more because the way the spending is going is to buy new stuff, right? So it, it's not a bad argument. Honestly, it's not bad. I, I just don't believe in it, personally. I mean, I, I, I give it to you because that's what's being debated in Congress right now. Right? The demand siders are saying, if we lower taxes, you're going to see growth in aggregate demand. This, this incentive to work thing is baloney. The supply side economists, congressmen, are saying, wait, 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 no, that's not true. It's not just going to shift aggregate demand. It's also going to shift the supply that's out there. And if we start supplying more goods, 
then the demand that's growing will be able to keep up with the aggregate supply and will be good, right? Now, the, the biggest argument that, that I have against it is that what are we making in this country right now? Are we making manufacturing goods anymore? We're good at agriculture. We're, we're, we're sort of good at building cars. So I mean, if you think about the car industry, what's been happening to the car industry over the last, say, three, four, five months? Yeah, I mean, we've seen a huge jump in aggregate supply for cars, right? Because the demand has been up there, the supply has said, well, we can keep up with this, right? So, and, and are there a whole bunch of incentives to buy a car right now? I mean, are you getting a $2,000 trade-in or any of that bit crap they were doing two or three years ago? No. So, I mean, maybe it's working. Uh -huh. Same sort of business, right? And if it keeps growing, eventually there will have to be more firms that were created in order to build houses and right, get that circle going. Right? The question, though, is how do you get the circle going? Do you do it with demand? Do you do it with supply? And again, it's hard to determine where you're necessarily adjusting. It's a little bit of both, right? And so that, and that's, again, that's, this is where the, the art play, right? Should it be that, that we stimulate the economy by having the government spend, or do we stimulate the economy by lowering income taxes? And th that's really an open question, even today. Right. So again, the key, though, is that on the supply side economics, the government does things that try to affect supply instead of affecting demand. Whereas on the demand side, normal discretionary fiscal policy, which we've been practicing f since the 30s, is generally driven towards making demand grow, right? So st stimulus money, right? Or if it is lowering taxes, it's lowering taxes on directly on the group of people who are going to spend. So a lot of what government, uh, demand side government people say is, well, we need to lower the taxes on the ultra poor, right? Continue the earned income tax credit. In fact, start tying it to inflation so that it actually grows higher, right? So that the people who are truly poor get inflationary increases in their earned income tax credit so that they can continue to purchase more, right? And that, that it's all demand driven, not supply driven. <sighs> Again, that's, it's great stuff to get into an argument over, but <laughs> it's really hard to, to ask questions in an economics class where we're not going to go into any of the detail too terribly much. So what I want you to know when it comes to the supply side of economics theory is that it's government policy that's affecting supply as opposed to government policy that's affecting demand, all right? So lowering things like, you know, trying to get incentives to create new technology, right? That's supply side economics. That's supply side discretionary policy, right? So if the government is going to pay companies to upgrade their technology, supply side economic theory. If the government is going to do things like go out and buy new roads and upgrade the, the infrastructure, that's affecting the demand side, right? So that's what I want you to be able to do when you hear about government action, is tell me which side are we working on? Are we trying to push the supply side or are we trying to push the demand side? All right? It's good stuff. Homework. What, what was that, page 341? Uh -huh. 2, 4, 6, and 11. <laughs> Chapter 15, right? Yeah. All right. And that is enough for today. Done a little bit early. We'll start in on chapter 16. Next week's quiz. How many chapters have you given to me? Uh, up to 21. I gave you a, an outline of what we're going to cover, right? Yes. First day? Yes. Um, did, we, did you go over the 14 appendix? A little bit, yeah. Oh. That was what we started with on Monday. Okay. I'll just read through it again. Or is it going to be on. Um,
you need to know what classical economists believe. Oh, right. Which is, that's what the appendix I, then is. I read that. Never mind. Yeah. I'm, I'm good. Nick, did you turn me off? <laughs>